weed is being recorded. Great. Oh, yeah. Okay. Tasting in progress. If you're taking part in something like this, you are probably a little bit geeky, a little bit nerdy. You give a shit about whiskey. So we don't need to start at the beginning. Boutique is not the beginning. Boutique is something that uh, even to approach boutique whiskey takes a little bit of whiskey understanding, I think, from the labels to the liquid. Boutique is all about uh, adventure into new frontiers of whiskey, uh, whether that's strange casks, uh, unusual expressions, magical, rare, unrepeatable bottlings from Scotland or New World whiskeys, whether it be from a whole series of Australian whiskeys we recently did or home nations like we're tasting today. Um, whiskeys, there are many people who I think um, still believe that uh, Ireland, America and Scotland are the only people making whiskey around the world. We, of course, uh, anyone on a call like this is well aware that's not the case and Boutique is really proud to be at the forefront of sort of figuring that out and, and, and being on that journey trying to bottle some of the coolest uh, uh, whiskeys from around the world and blend some of them too. We've bought, uh, oh that's my daughter screaming. Uh, cool. Didn't get enough fried chicken. Yeah. Amber. Right so please yeah like Craig said uh ask questions. We'll make this a dialogue. Denver and I will shoot the shit, I'm sure, too, and Simon can pop in whenever. But we're going to take you through six different whiskeys in an order that we've selected. I think I'm correct in saying we're going to start with Glen Elgin. Uh, I think Cotswolds, actually. You, you had Cotswolds, right? but we can do Glen Elgin. Glen Elgin's a great place to start. I, no, no, it's fine. You, you, I think if it's okay, can you remind me the order? But I should have done this before we killed on because I, I think I, I took Craig's list as the order. So, yeah, we've got uh, Cotswolds. I'll, I'll drop it in the chat for everybody as well. We've got Cotswolds, number one. Number two, for Oxford, we've got Oxford Artisan. Number three, we have uh, Nick Nian. Four is the Glen Elgin. Five is the Blair Athol. And number six, we're finishing with the Strathmill. Trump. Well, whoever came up with that is very smart because that makes complete sense. Yeah, it was it was you. That was you. <laughs> well, look, the good news is I agree with myself. I think uh, I'm on to something there. Cool. Apologies, everyone. So let's, the Cotswolds was the first thing in our glass. And let me slow down and just introduce myself. So again, I, I'm Sam. And I know you're thinking, how does someone so young and vibrant and charming become head of whiskey at somewhere like Adam Brands? Well, Luck, bribery. Simon, the head of. Oh, I didn't know Simon was the head now. Oh, gotcha. Sam is. Sam is. <laughs> See what he's done there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. It was too easy. It was just a really easy assist. Anyway, go for it. Sorry, Sam. It's okay. Everyone, everyone who's patiently waiting for us to get onto the taste is like, what the, what the fuck have I signed up to? Who are these guys? Yeah, I can see John's nodding. Well, look. You know, look, at least we're not in person because you could walk out of the room. You're stuck now, buddy. <laughs> cool. Um, so I, I, as Craig really said, though, I, I'm a whiskey geek first and foremost. I think all, Denver and, and Simon are too. We're just very lucky to work in whiskey and to found a way to do that. Um, and uh, at Adam Brands, I came from Balveni and I worked with the Whiskey Exchange and Sukhinder Singh and Compass Box with John Glazer. But most recently with Balveni, working with, with David Stewart, who's the malt master, the, uh, the master blender for Glenfiddich and Grants and Balveni for well over 50 years now. Uh, and I worked closely with him in, in his, uh, in the last two years I was at Balveni in managing stock. So learning how stock modeling work, how, do, how you figure out what to release, when, uh, how you future plan, uh, and then assembling things like the DCS compendium and Balveni Ton 1401 and 1858 and things like that. So really getting an understanding of whiskey from the, the it's kind of less sexy, you know, because David in, himself describes himself as a, um, a stock manager. So that's basically what I am here at Adam Brands, but we get to have a lot of fun with Boutique. So let's jump into Cotswolds. We're going to start with an English whiskey. These are part of our uh, Home Nations series. All the whiskeys we're trying tonight are part of our Home Nation series. We have different sort of themed releases about four times a year from Boutique. Uh, the idea being that we can show, uh, let's do it like that. Uh, we can gather whiskeys on a theme, you know, and that, that could be anything from, you know, distilleries that use column stills uh, to exclusively rye whiskeys. 
or in this case, whiskeys from all of the uh, all over the British Isles that we've called our Home Nations series. So that's included Adnams. You might have heard of the brewery. Uh, you know, forty year old, forty day old whiskey from uh, Circumstance Distillery, and it included a twelve year old English from St George's and a twenty nine year old Irish. So really, whiskey all over from from three to to twenty nine in this release. And the Cotswolds is where we're going to start. Has anyone tried Cotswolds before? Oh, I've lost. How can I see everybody? All right, Simon puts his hand up. That's great, Simon. That's very helpful. Thank you, buddy. Uh, well, I, I visited Cotswold maybe five years ago for the first time, and uh, it, it's a beautiful location. It's, it's beautiful farmland around there uh, as well, and just a lovely place to visit. Um, but it's also got a history and association culturally in this country anyway, in the UK, where I'm clearly not from, um, with the, the uh, murder mystery TV program. And so some of the label is bringing that to life. So it's based on a theme of this bright, colorful uh, vintage leaflet for people to visit a local town, but also has this uh, images, I guess, from the, um, from the program as well. You'll also see uh, in the foreground, I guess, in this river going under the bridge, a swan. And that's because uh, Daniel Zor, the founder of the distillery, hired Jim Swan, uh, whose name you may have heard associated with distilleries all over the world, uh, being a Scottish scientist uh, and consultant in his later years. He's sadly passed away now, but um, consultant helping uh, distilleries, especially New World distilleries, acquire the flavor they were after quickly. Now, I, I don't know how nerdy you want me to get. I know you want to move through this, but I think it's fascinating to remember, and it's important for all of us to remember who most of us, myself included, get really got into whiskey through scotch. But we forget, I think, that scotch only became what we think of it now over a period of probably 40 to 100 years. It was rot gut. It was inconsistent. Um, it wasn't sold as single. It was made as fodder for blends. It was made as like a... Uh, produced to be uh, much nicer to consume when it was mixed with other spirits. Um, and over time, the spirit became more refined that it could, you know, fit the palates of the middle classes south of Hadrian's Wall. Get into that chicken dinner. Um, mm -hmm. And that's sort of what we think of today. But so a lot of craft distillers, if you're starting a new distillery, whether it be in Tasmania or in Toronto, where I'm from, you don't want to wait 40 to 100 years to get a return on your investment or to, to make have your product be drinkable because, um, it, you know, it's an agricultural product. In Scotland, it really grew out of the farming season, out of the farming tradition, like wine. And so um, Jim went to all distilleries, Milk and Honey and the uh, Pandaren and Cotswolds and many others to consult and help them uh, be able to get a mature, robust spirit after just three years. And I think, I hope you agree that this, this you would not necessarily guess this was a three-year-old whiskey. And I would also dare to say that if this was a three-year-old Linkwood, it would be far less mature. It would have a lot more of the new make cereal uh, type of notes. Where this is sweet and it's rich. There's, you know, almonds. I get a lot of marzipan in the, in the character of, uh, of the Cotswold Distillery. But there's also like fruitiness, pineapple and cherries and things like that. And I do, I do recommend adding water, something worth saying, but probably geeks like you all realize um, uh, is that this is high strength. We bottle at Boutique, we bottle at uh, batch strength, we call it. Because um, sometimes if we've married barrels together, it's not strictly speaking cask strength. When we do single barrels, we sometimes bottle at cask strength. And we say that on the label with a little uh, tag in the top left-hand corner now to make it clear that it's, it says NCS, natural or nearly cast strength is what we say because we're boutique and we're being silly, but it's natural cask strength. Um, and this one is not natural cask strength. We brought it to 50.4. Uh, so it's sort of, it's a drink. It's a great drinking strength. You can add water, uh, but it's also simple at strength. Uh, yes, fun fi. I've got, a, I've got a question, Sam. Um, Denver, I'm from uh, Denver and Lolly. Um, the uh, the label there. So, like, how are they aging? Because this is this would be if you release this in any other part of Scotland, I'd feel like it would be like you mentioned before. It tastes way more new making. How are they aging this so quick? Is it like are they aging it in the Caribbean and then bringing it back, or like what's going on? <laughs> 
it's not a terrible idea. It probably has a bit of a carbon footprint. Uh, mm. and, I'd pay more for that. Yeah. But uh, ver various different things. So one thing um, that a lot of Scotch distilleries have started to do over the last 80 years um, is to standardize fermentation and to use uh, controlled yeasts across many distilleries. So the ferments that they get are very controlled, which is very important if your ingredients are going into Johnny Walker. It needs to taste the same 12, you know, all the time so that those component parts, those colors, those pigments remain the same. Whereas a new distillery, it's, it's, it's yet unwritten, you know? So at Cotswolds, for example, they have, I think, three different ferment times. That might, they might be more now, but the three, three different ferment times, and that's going to give different characters to the, the, the ale that's going to be distilled. So they also distill those ales separately, mature them separately, and then they can bring them together at various parts of the maturation. So that's, that's one area that they can affect um, how mature the spirit might be or what kind of characteristics the, the spirit might have. Uh, another thing, I, I hope I'm right on this. I should have looked this up, but Denver, I think at, at Cotswolds, one of the things they, they were already set up when Jim came in and I think Jim, and I think Jim changed the angle of their line arm just by like yeah, okay. four or six degrees. So that wow. there'd be just, just slightly more reflux or something like this, or maybe the other way actually, so that it would come off quicker. I can't remember. I'm sorry. I need to look it up, but there's, there's some change he made to the angle of the, the, the line arms uh, that I think affected also the spirit that they were producing. Cause they, they said they, that they wanted a fruity pineapple cherry type of thing with, you know, marzipan Christmas cake, that type of thing. So he said, well, if you want to capture those type of uh, chem chemically, if you want to capture those spirits, here's what I recommend. So he, he optimizes yeah. the thing to the, to the desired flavor. And then the, the next layer of, uh, I guess, influence he has is, is in casks. And this has yeah. had a lasting effect uh, across the whole industry, not just the Jim Swan distilleries, the distilleries that he's worked on. Um, across the whole industry, people use what's called now STR. Yeah. Yeah. Is that just my echo or is someone speaking? No. I think it's Sebastian. That's okay. Sebastian, uh, sorry, say, yeah, 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 take it off. Sorry. Not to worry, bud. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so the, the last thing is STR, and that's uh, skived and toasted red wine barrels. So there's a tradition in yeah, Scotland right. that's only happened really in the last 15 to 20 years to, to be ecological and economical too, and to reuse <laughs> barrels as much as possible. So companies have started shaving the inside of barrels. But even more than that, they started cutting grooves. Because of course, if you cut a groove in a piece of wood, the surface area is greater and potentially yeah. twice as big. So you're getting a lot more wood interaction. And so these, these uh, STR casts have that sort of groove effect. So you're getting more uh, oxygen and wood and interplay. Uh, and also their wine casts. So they're, they're special in that regard too, that they, they're giving a certain type of toastiness. Uh, in this case, it's a red wine uh, barrique that we've bottled here and so that says more about the barrel than the previous ingredients because they, they definitely you can see it. otherwise the whiskey would be pink it's completely mm. dumped it's completely emptied but some of that fruitiness the red currants and thing i think for me does come through on, on this whiskey sorry I, I would say sam that the actual um the liquid is much darker than the bottle shot we have in the presentation there i think that was an earlier mock up that bottle um but yeah if you actually have have a look it's got a much more intense color from that red wine yeah. berry. Yeah, that's totally worth saying, and that's absolutely true. Yeah, these are these the images and these decks are mock-ups. You're absolutely right. Yeah, no, the, the color that came out was darker, but not still not pink, woody, like a, a, a browner amber uh, color, and it gives all that fruity complexity. So those are the three ways that Swan really affected all the. Oh, you have a bottle there, Craig. Oh wow, yeah. If you're speaking, we can't hear you, Craig. Sorry. Sorry, on you, on you. Um, was it? Yeah, the color on it there. I don't think we can see that. Um, if they've got uh, everybody, everyone up, or, or they can just see the uh, the shared screen. But uh, it's, it's certainly a, a much radier color. I think with the the, the notes I'm getting on the nose is like a cherry note, a stewed cherry, and for me that's the kind of color of it as well. So it's really bringing me back to that stewed cherry, which is quite nice, and then also like a real nice creamy buttery caramel 
and that's what again with the color so the, i guess the nose for me is very distinctive to the, the color of the whiskey as well which is great you know i really like that i like drinking a whiskey like that mm. but thanks for reminding me actually the buttery thing you're talking about that's also related to their ferment so that's something they specifically wanted because the, that matures well. So Blair Ethel, Mortlock, Klein Leash, those type of characteristics we know at great age become mind blowing and coveted. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing Cotswolds wanted. So that buttery character is present in the new spirit. It's present at three years old. And hopefully as the distillery ages, it'll be present 12, 20 and, and 50 years old down mm -hmm. the route, that line as well. Yeah, cool. I hope everyone like. If it's your first English whiskey or your first Cotswolds, I, I do hope you enjoyed it. It's, uh, I think it was a cracking whiskey. We bottled a thousand uh, bottles of this for our first themed release. Uh, and then we released an additional 500 for this Home Nations uh, release. And I think it's now all gone. It's gone from us anyway. It might still be in stores. Obviously, Craig's got some too. But uh, it's a beauty and it was... Uh, much loved you know when we've included it in our advent calendars people absolutely loved it so it's cool mm. nice fair not oxford i don't want to rush people along but are we okay to continue yeah mm, definitely getting okay. okay, nods great um this is a super exciting bottling uh, i it's worth pointing out too that this image is completely wrong as well in terms of color uh, right off the bat but the label is right and let's let's go through the label uh let me just back it up slightly um marchin miller if you've ever heard this name he was the founding editor of whiskey magazine uh he's an awesome wine drinker and a lovely guy to go to lunch with because it becomes dinner and then becomes a taxi home at midnight but he's an entrepreneur and just a lovely, enthusiastic whiskey guy who uh, I would say 15 to 20 years ago had an idea that he should buy a bunch of Japanese whiskey. And with some friends, he bought a distillery that was closed that no one cared about called Karazawa. And everyone thought it was a terrible idea, including his friend Sukinder Singh, the owner of the whiskey exchange. He said, why are you buying this shit? No one wants it. And um, well, who's laughing now? But uh, so he set up with some friends, the number one drinks company, imported Japanese whiskey. He now owns a Japanese distillery called Kyoto. He founded uh, this distillery, uh, the V Oxford Artisan Distillery, which, you know, spells out toad. So he's, he's, he's a bit of a goof. Uh, and again, it's not just him, it's him and his buddies and his investors. Um, but he spearheads these, these ideas. And the idea with Oxford was to make uh, an, an English whiskey uh, in a traditional way using local ingredients. And I think this is super cool and, and really future safe. He works with an amazing uh, plant biologist uh, named John Letts. I'll show you a short video if you don't mind in a few minutes. Uh, fuck, actually, do I need to share again so that it does audio? Yes, I do. Share sound, share screen, uh -huh. and share. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's quite a, quite an amazing story of years of planning to be able to get organic grains certified and ready to be turned into booze. This doesn't happen overnight. This takes a long time. So this project has been in gestation for probably 10 to 20 years. Um, never mind how long the scientists himself spent on getting these grains right. But something you'll notice right away when you look at this label is it says single grain because in whiskey terms it's a, we had to decide it's not a single malt because it's not only malted barley uh it's it's not rye because it's not only rye it's actually it's a mixture of of different grains um all heritage some some heritage grains and some uh, organic grains all from the local area around the distillery you can see the label depicting oxford in the background with its universities and uh, other iconic steeples and things in the background, and then some stills thrown in. They have beautiful stills. If you want to Google the Oxford Artisan Distillery, absolutely gorgeous still set up. Uh, the, the colored houses. The uh, there's a joke here. If you can see the uh, the carbine harvester says comma. The brand name at the front is comma for the Oxford comma because that's just a stupid boutique type joke. 
There are people looking at corn. Uh, there's uh, me as a Canadian from the South Park with split head as a scarecrow. Um, what else is it? Uh, there's the head distiller inspecting the corn. Um, and that's about it. And so yeah, as you can see, yeah, so it's 51% corn, 34% rye, 10% wheat, 5% malted barley. But the coolest thing about this is it's their first cask. So we've known wow. March in a long time. Um, we were really excited when we started talking to try and get a, a cast from them, but this is the first cast they filled and they let us bottle it. And I don't want to boast or anything, but Boutique is tiny, right? It's not a commercial entity, but Boutique is cool. And people who are in our whiskey world recognize that. Boutique can do things that no one else can do. We had rye distillers in America want to have a blended rye, but they couldn't do it themselves because it led to fights. They asked us to do it. That's, that's a dream. There's the Empire Rye, because um, we, we can do this kind of thing. And um, it, so it's something we're really proud of uh, being able to do and to sort of push what's able to go into a bottle under the name whiskey, but also to be a place that distillers can play. You know, we worked with uh, the Gospel, uh, for example, recently, or a lot of great Australian distillers uh, last year, and again, for an upcoming release of Australian whiskeys, uh, spoiler alert. Um, and some of those folks we dealt with, they gave us, they offered us a series of casts to nose and taste that were unlike their house style because they can't release it because it's not something necessarily that's in line with what they want to project, but through us, they can. And so that's, it's, it's an awesome opportunity and it's a cool thing that Boutique gets away with. And it's what distillers themselves really appreciate about Boutique. So I think that's a, a cool thing. I've had, it's, it's nine in the morning. I've poured this one because I think it's mind-blowingly interesting totally unrepeatable because yeah, it's their first distillate. They change things after the first few runs. Um, I find it massively fruity, but lots of grain. It's look, it's, it's young. It, ha it has a spirity kick. So please do add water as well. But again, we bottled this at 50% of batch strength. So you can go either way. You can sip it neat, but uh, I, I do prefer with a few drops of water. Um, And it has this I'm getting quite, uh, um, waxy fruits like Sam. Are you, are you getting that? I'm like, I get like a waxy sort of chocolate, um, but with different sort of um, those cherries and all of that kind of gear within this wax. Like it's this like really expensive candle. Am I missing yeah, yeah, for lots of money? What, one of yeah, the, the tasty you notes know, I get, which is distinctly Australian, is uh, wattle seed. You get a little bit of wattle seed. That's yeah, like right. chocolatey coffee. Uh, the thing coming mm. so that i mean i would say both of, i don't know what wattle seed is but is it a is it like a an oil or what's what you get wattle seed oil yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard to explain i don't even know how you explain it without smelling well, i'll it. quickly okay. google it in another window but yeah um w-o-t-t-l-e uh, w-a-t-t-l-e yeah oh it's oh wow but yeah, it's a, a fantastic uh, Australian um, ingredient. But that, right, that, so it's, it's uh, yeah, it's a good kind of Aussie day for it. And so it's mixed into cakes, biscuits, and bread. So is it sweet itself? Yeah. No, no, it is savory. I mean, there are a few people trying to use it in whiskey. Um, so seventy-eight mm. degrees um, uh, have used some wattle seed in the past, along with other oh. native grains. And native grains are something we'll start to see a bit more in Australian whiskey, I think, which is fantastic. Except for obviously they're prohibitively expensive <laughs> is the issue. Well, look, that, that is a problem, but I, I don't, I mean, we pay too little for dead animal. We pay, we, you know, the, there's artificial pricing across the whole food chain and it's, it's, it's insane, actually. Uh, that brings me yeah. to mind that we actually share this video to John, because I think, I think responsible, if whiskey can play some small part in, uh, investing in in grains that are sustainable it protects the soil it's better for cattle it's better for the the wider ecosystem it's especially in an island like the uk it's it's flood resistant it's uh and the government doesn't fund it because here there's laws actually banning certain uh, grains from being grown um there's approved grains and it, it's it's kind of insane it's it serves massive um food companies. And uh, I think, I think the, the small role Oxford plays in making sure that some fields are getting filled with responsible grains is that will have an effect, a positive effect uh, on, on the future of agriculture, I think. So 
if I could share quickly, if you can't hear this quick, uh, as I press play, uh, Simon, if you or someone I can see, you can stick your hand up and say, stop, Sam. This is John Letts, just a, a minute and 50 seconds, talking about what he's done and what he's doing with Oxford. And I think it's, uh, I think it's an interesting little clip. Hello, my name is John Letts. I'm a, a farmer, an organic farmer, an archaeobotanist. I always call myself um, and a, a plant breeder based in the UK. And I coordinate the grain that's being used for the Oxford Artisan Distillery to make a very fine whiskey, which has just been launched. So basically, I have a system where my mantra is in diversity, there is strength. We're clearly in a period of extreme crisis. The last few years, we keep having droughts. We're in the middle of a drought right now. Well, thank God it rained yesterday because the cereal farmers were starting to get really worried in the UK that we're repeating last year. Well, because these crop, ancient crops, these older crops have such deep root systems, they can survive these crises. And that's the whole prediction for climate change, isn't it? It's unpredictability in extreme events. Well, plant breeders have to think 10 years ahead. Well, modern varieties can't cope with that. You know, the number of times where I've had my field planted right next to a crop of modern cereal, modern wheat, and the drought comes, the modern wheat is brown, dead, the seeds are tiny. You can, you can, you can distill them and, 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 and draw whatever flavor you can come out of them, but they're inferior in my view. And my crops, almost a meter and a half tall, green and thriving, and you know, the proof's in the pudding. What's what's horrible is that these crops are illegal. You know, I can't spread the seed out. That's what's strange. I couldn't give you that even if I wanted to because of the law is all supporting, uh, you know, the marketing of modern varieties. So it's insane. Even though this is a solution at every level, uh, in a, from sustainability, genetic diversity, pollinators, all of that, it is actually illegal to market these crops. The whole system is stacked against us, but yet that is the system that is supporting modern brewing and modern distilling and the modern flower industry. So we have a deep transformation we have to do. A little bit heartbreaking, but really, really cool. I think that they're, they're... Oh, Hello. I skip now. How do I get out of that? Oh, dear. Hello, my name's John right, Lance. I'm yeah, a, now, buddy. a farmer. And that was brilliant, Sam. He's a brilliant guy, and it's a it's a really cool thing. But it relates sort of, you know, uh, it, it, it is it does result in a more expensive product. But whiskey is a luxury. I think it's a category that can. I spoke to the head of the environmental concerns at Diageo for our World Whiskey Summit, which that was from. And I recommend you go watch it. It's got voices from around the whiskey world, including Denver, uh, talking about all topics around whiskey that. Um, I think would be of interest to any, any geek who's on a tasting like this, the World Whiskey Summit from uh, Boutique Whiskey. Um, but yeah, so, sorry? Oh, no, I was just laughing. It was a good plug. I got to drop it in there, buddy. I spent a lot of time on that, and I got about four 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 hits. Oh, man, I love the Boondiggy. Um, what is it? The Yeah, that's um, really good, man. All right, fine. I'm going to drink coffee out of your fucking glass. <laughs> right um yeah but so uh, the, the result is that it's expensive right so wh whiskey is is an industry or a, a product that can afford to build in higher costs you know it can afford to build in higher costs into the process and if they can pass those down the supply chain whether it's more responsible glass or more responsible uh, energy use to distillers or more responsible grain i, th I think it's, it's it is on uh, a category like whiskey to play some small part in uh, in improving those things and finding an infrastructure that uh, that makes sense. So I think it's a cool thing. I think, oh, it's the best. Actually, tea, tea out of the Denver glass is lovely. That's no joke. And ice cream, apparently. My sister does that. <laughs> Let's see, uh, what do you reckon the future is for, like, um, marketing? Like, because that is more responsible to to use sort of local grains and it's better for the environment. You still have all that biodiversity and I'm really, really great for the soil. Um, I'm really interested to see what the response will be from the market because it is a more expensive whiskey, as you mentioned before. How do we get that across the line? Because it is the right thing to do, but then how do you get those guys away from the typical sort of blends? It's tough because blended scotch, let's say, or even scotch whiskey is artificially cheap. I mean, I can buy at my supermarket near me where things are already very squeezed on margin. I think I spoke to the buyer at Tesco, a big chain here. 
he makes between two and four percent on his spirits. Wow, absolutely insane business model. Um, uh, and so those prices are cutthroat. They cut. They they kill the little the independent retailer because they're they're not operating on any margins. They're hoping for people to come in to buy their meat. They're a lure, I guess, uh, to get people through that door. But you can buy gin for. 10 pounds more than a 12 year old scotch whiskey in my my tesco that's crazy yeah. that gin didn't cost that much more it didn't use wood it wasn't produced in a pot still it didn't use more energy um it's just got clever branding and it has maybe a, a, a word of the day on it that, that is somehow appealing to a consumer which is absolutely fine i'm not knocking that practice at all but part of the problem is we as consumers are used to a chunk of cow being cheaper than a chunk of cheese that's insane that's so uh, that sort of artificial pricing fund whether it's from government funding or from other reasons it, it there is some inequity there and I, I that that's what needs to be reconciled so scotch is reconciled i don't know if, any, if you've seen this yet craig as a, as a buyer but certainly diageo william grant and pernod all of their prices have gone up here They've, they're all expecting there to be massive inflation uh, over the, the next little while because of COVID, I assume. Um, but also to reflect their huge, I'm talking billions of pounds investment in, in ecological glass, in uh, recyclable programs, uh, and in responsible grain sourcing. Um, that is cost is hasn't cost them money yet, really, but they're paying it forward. They're they're getting they're getting the consumer used to paying a bit more. So we've seen Lagavulin go up for the first time really since I've been into whiskey and i've always said it's amazing we all criticize the death star diageo but you've been able to buy like in the same price as when i got into whiskey in 2002 when i moved to scotland basically they're there thereabouts and that's insane uh, but so now they've they've adjusted massively i don't know if you've seen that craig yeah definitely we've not seen it here as much i mean we are now pushing into the fact that it's taken around about six to eight months to get whiskey here from last year, like a lot of Christmas stock arrived in January and February. So we're all really heavily stocked at the moment because of that delay. And that as that's came in, it's sort of, we're starting to see the fact that it's costing a little bit more. I think the next import of whiskey that you start to see coming in in July, August, you'll start to see prices hike significantly. Um, we we uh, also import Signatory, obviously another independent bottler. And uh, Signatory recently, have uh, you know declared the fact that cardboard's gone up and yeah, sustainability items have, have pushed the, their prices up and um, just things like glassware, labels, everything's gone up right across the board. Um, and so much so that I'm not sure if you know, but Signatory has actually been um, not sold off, but a shared partnership now in Signatory. Uh, it's uh, it's actually sold off to another company who's joining, joining in with them because of these increases in costs. And uh, those two companies now will work on this more uh, environmentally friendly way to produce the whiskey, to transport whiskey, to bottle it. Um, and uh, they needed those funds because, and I would imagine a lot of the smaller guys across the industry are now looking at that. Where am I going to get the funds from to catch up with the big guys doing this now? So this is a real big, you know, eye opener. And I think in Australia, we're quite lucky because we're quite, we're at the start of our industry here. So I think a lot of people have already put that in play. You know, we're paying a little bit more for a whiskey here, but a lot of the guys have already put this sort of environmental thing at the back of their head and already started to produce. So it's quite it's going to be interesting next day. Uh, ne the next decade of whiskey is going to be very interesting. Absolutely. Mm. There's, there's certainly some Australian whiskey that's now coming in at a fairly attractive price point. Mm. But um, we see the same thing over here, Sam. Like a lot of the big market leaders, like, you know, your Glenn, your William Grants and Sons, Perno. Um, no, they're artificially cheap when you see them at uh, you know one of the big uh, you know BWS or Liquorland, and if, if you're yeah. buying a, a ten or twelve year old mainstream label, that the price is actually criminally low because it's really devaluing the quality of that juice. There's nothing wrong with a Glenfiddich twelve year old. It's it's great quality juice. It shouldn't be as cheap as what they're charging for it. And it's just there's so many rebates in there from those big companies that are setting up this false perception of value and it's something that needs to change like how is a glenfiddich 12 less than a bottle of starwood solera You're like that you know that does and that doesn't make sense it's come from scotland we pay extra duty on it it's got 12 years of age compared to like three or four 
it's uh, it, it doesn't make sense and it will change. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, certainly hope that the customer base. Oh, sorry, Sam. I, I certainly hope that the customer base responds to that because you just like it's not just whiskey. Like you can buy a lamp that's made in China for six dollars at IKEA, and somehow that 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 plastic had to be made, it had to be shipped, had to be put together, put in a package, sent over here, and then staff had to put it on a shelf, and it's six dollars. So I think I think we will pay for it, and um, people just don't realize that. We do pay for it. It just needs to be a little bit more transparent as to where those costs are, where those costs are really, because um, we do pay for that in, in our environment. And it's something that we all share in. Um, and hopefully, I, I really hope that it does change in the future and people do support that and they're happy to spend, you know, another five bucks, another 10 bucks mm -hmm. on a bottle of whiskey or or on just general choices in, in your life kind of thing. So um, anyway, I'll get off my soapbox, get on to the next whiskey. <laughs> like, it's like Gary was saying though. I, like Gary was saying though, it's like loads of people have bought a lot of whiskey recently. You know, it's been big, and I think a lot of people have been storing it away. So I think you've got to that point now where you know there are a lot of collectors, there's a lot of people with a lot of whiskey in their collection, and uh, you know they're just going to drink through that for the next decade. <laughs> so, save up. <laughs> I wish I'd done that with that lag of bullion, I'll tell you when it was fifty quid. Jesus, oops. <laughs> yeah, good. I'm just. Catching up on the chat here too. I'm glad you like the whiskey there. Uh, this first cask. Awesome. Yeah, good points, guys. Thanks. Off the, I, I led you on the soapbox. You don't need to apologize, bud. <laughs> Let's move along then to, uh, I don't know, we call this new, within Boutique Towers, we call the new distillers of Scotland New World Scotch. <laughs> I don't know if that's fair, but there's a whole generation of new distilleries um starting in scotland which is really exciting because they get to benefit from the traditions and um i guess the the clout that the, the word scotch whiskey has because you know the biggest brand name in scotch whiskey isn't glenfiddich or johnny walker or whatever the biggest brand name in scotch whiskey is that phrase scotch whiskey because if you can put that on your bottle you're immediately elevated in the consumer's mind um and people are more willing to try different things within scotch i mean what other industry I mean, wine, obviously, but spirits industry, can you have a hundred different uh, products, uh, just distill distilleries, actually pr proprietary products available on the shelf from one style of drink. It's pretty incredible the way Scotch whiskey has grown. But let's go to a recent distillery, uh, Nick Nian. So Nick Nian is a distillery on the way to nowhere on the uh, West Coast of Scotland, you'd be heading no, you'd be heading to the sea, I suppose, if you if you bothered to drive out there. It's a beautiful part of the country, though, and not often hit. Um, they've managed to find a way to be uh, self sufficient in energy and carbon neutral. Um, just on the topic we were just talking about, but they uh, they've been friends of ours since before they even had a product called whiskey. Uh, we've been in touch with Annabelle and a bunch of members of her team for years because they're just really cool whiskey people. They're at the whiskey shows. They're whiskey geeks like us. Um, and their heart's in the right place. You know, one thing, um, and you'll probably see this in, in Australia and in Tassie, um, distilleries, new distilleries that start off uh, funded by uh, capital investors and someone trying to make money in two to five years, they're not going to they're not going to be doing things in the right way for the long term, and and whiskey is a slow game, and I, I'm happy to be proven wrong. But I've, can, I've already seen it in the U.S. A lot of distilleries either folding or having to sell out um, because they just weren't becoming uh, cash cows that their investors thought. Whiskey isn't cannot only be about that. You speak to the people at Milk and Honey. You speak to the people at Nick Neen, The founders they all say something similar, which is this is a gift to my grandchildren. I'm doing this for. Uh, my family legacy. I'm doing this for my father's legacy. I took some of his money and I set up this distillery. It doesn't have to be today. It doesn't have to be in a hundred years, but one day I want this distillery to always carry his name. I mean, that's, that's, that's the, that's the whiskey game, taking your time with it. And uh, yeah, like I said, the guys at Milk and Honey, his, his, his the founders thing, he, he has, a, makes a living for other industries, but the whiskey distillery is only about, uh, you know, leaving a legacy. It's a fun project to leave a legacy for his grandchildren. So Nick Nian is very similar. Um, th their goal is to create a modern uh, organic distillery in Scotland powered by renewable energy. 
and uh, it's also benefited from the tutelage, I guess, of uh, Jim Swan. So on the label, there's a bit of a play uh, of the of the uh, birth of Venus, but instead of Venus uh, in the shell, <laughs> we have uh, Annabelle Thomas, <laughs> the founder, uh, in a swan, uh, riding a swan, Jim Swan. Um, right near where their distillery is, the Drimmon Peninsula is what's portrayed behind her. Um, and the uh, Nick Nian is a Gaelic a term for uh, the goddess of spirits. So a distillery named after a goddess, we had to have some themes of that and the sort of angelic thing going on in the background. And of course we had to include uh, her, her colleagues and uh, this, uh, the, the swan. Jim was very involved in all of the process from the very beginning at this distillery. They wanted to make a crazy fruity high ester spirit um, and they wanted to have low, long, long uh, ferments to be able to get uh, certain types of fruity characteristics from the spirit. Um, early iterations were a bit nutty and I think they made an amendment after a year in their, in their still regime. Um, but this uh, is our second cast. They, they gave us a bunch of uh, casts to choose from. We've bottled uh, Nick Meehan twice and they've both uh, sold out and been absolutely loved by critics and, and whiskey lovers too. It's a very cool distillery, great story, and awesome people most importantly. Uh, and this is bottled at cast strength, 59.8%. So you stick your nose in there, it, it's, it's, it's punchy. So I, I do certainly advise water or at least letting it sit for a while or let you know pass it by your nose gently to just try to get some of that aroma and let the alcohols flash off. But even a few drops will, will push some of the alcohol away. But I would probably add equal parts personally uh, of however much whiskey I'd add the same water to drink rather than nose and taste. But do, do as you like. Um, big, creamy, zesty sort of uh, characteristics. I get a bit of like green banana. It's not said here, but I get this, like this says freshly cut grass, uh, freshly cut green oak, I mean, sorry. I get this sort of un unripe banana. My wife always buys green bananas because the kids don't like it when they go brown. I'm the opposite. I want a brown, diesely banana. But um, it's like when they're too early and I can't eat them. Uh, hard banana. But full, again, vanilla on the nose, vanilla on the palate. It's, it's just a beautiful expression. And this is, I think, also from my STR. I need to just check that quickly. It's from one of his STR casks. Do you know that offhand, Simon? Simon, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, it says here, first fill barrel on your on, on the notes. Oh, thank you. Um, Ian. Oh yeah, it is the first fill bourbon. Nice. There you go. Um, just one tip, I guess, with um, something that's sort of that high in proof. Um, Sam touched on it before, but um, I, I would try and stay towards the top of your glass. So um, even if, if you're not handling it, sort of at the top of the glass, then go above the top of the glass and then try and smell it from there and also try and smell it with your mouth open. It'll, it'll dull it down a little bit, but you're still getting a lot of information um, to your brain. Well, that, that's a, I mean, let's plug the glass though, but I mean, that is a great, that's something I've loved about this glass. First of all, with Glenn Cairns, with a schnoz like this, I can't always get in there. And I, I like drinking whiskey out of a tea mug. So in my tasting room, Simon's been there and others make fun of me because I have, when I'm finished a blend, I put it in a tea mug or a coffee mug so I can get right in there and live in the space. When you're with a Glen Cairn, I, can, I, I have to like lean all the way back to get it down my throat. It's, it's difficult. Um, but this, with these glasses, yes, you can sip and everything else. But, but what I was going to say is just about high ABV is look at that surface area. The whiskey spreads super thin. And there are distilleries in the U.S. that before they bottle, they leave their whiskey in flat, shallow pools before they bottle to let alcohols flash off. So this whiskey, this, this glass, I mean, is already doing you a favor uh, before you even add water. The glass itself is allowing a lot of space for, for volatiles to escape. When you give a swirl, they'll fly away. And maybe you can catch some of them. You don't want to go right in there like I do with my coffee mug. Um, but I, I think that's a great point. Uh, leaving your mouth open, Deborah, is, is great advice that I learned probably too late as I was getting into whiskey. But I think where you even are on the glass does make a difference too. 
Yeah, thanks for that, Sam. Checks in the mail, mate. Um, <laughs> the yeah, if you can, yeah, if you can smell at the top of your glass, if it, what whichever glass you've got, especially an hourglass, though, but at the top you're going to get. Um, you're going to kind of go a little bit more behind the alcohol and at the bottom, you're going to get the full hit. Um, so if you have that sort of flexibility, great. Um, if you've got a clean can, then yeah, just smell above. But like Sam said, um, yeah, the greatest sort of surface area, you kind of flash that off. And then depending on the shape of your glass, um, you can also get good air circulation on the inside. And the, the thing is when you're drinking whiskies like this, like quality whiskies, you're not there just to get hammered. It's not a pint of lager. It's like, it's meant to be a, craft beer pardon the pun or it's meant to be a craft whiskey um so we're, we're not here to get super hammered we're here to like really enjoy the smell and the taste um and then the and the craft that that distiller has put in so just um yeah i guess that's what we're meant to focus on so that's what we should it's interesting that you were talking about um marketing though you know you brought up the marketing of a of a cow and a cheese and the cheese etc and the whiskey glass i think right now is just, we're in that we're in that spot right now where the the most marketed glass is the glass that everybody has and they think it's the best glass and it's the best glass to hold and it's the best glass to drink from because it's heavily marketed to you and your brain then thinks that's the glass you should have and then you actually find glasses that are then predominantly made to make the whiskey taste smell better you know they've been created more out of love than profit and you sort of go, well, you know, and uh, you at least got to have one of them because you can see the difference, you know. And uh, yeah, like I'm not plugging a glass for you, mate, but I um, I carry this one everywhere, everywhere because you really, and and we we carry uh, a Glen Cairn glass and a um, one of these wine glasses with us as well. We carry them everywhere we go, every distillery we go to to taste, and you can tell the difference between them. And that's why we take them because we do nose and taste from those glasses, but then you end up just having this basically um, as, uh, as, as, as your glass that, you know, you, re, you, you get the true flavor from it, the true aroma from it. It's good for cast strength whiskey and not, but um, so it's good to that. I am. Um, I, yeah. I, I think um, somebody was talking about having coffee in it. I don't know if anybody's ever tried the, uh, I don't, I, I don't know if I've got it on me. The, um, have you got it there? That this is yeah, the most got, amazing thing. About the I planet. actually use this for coffee um, nearly every day. <laughs> yeah. So amazing thing on the planet, yeah. Um, so if you ever see these for sale anywhere, these are actually stainless steel glasses from Denver and Lily. Yeah, and, they're, um, they're sold out nine months ago, man. So no one will be back out again. Denver's Denver's. I think there's one in Hedonism actually, in uh, Mayfair. I think that's the last one in the world for sale. <laughs> are, you making, are you making another batch or never again? Ah, uh, yeah, we are. Yeah, we've just had like, run into like the perfect storm of shortage of like people, skill, and materials. And then after that, we've got to then get it places, and there's a shortage of like ships. So um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, we'll probably be at the end of the year, but there's just, I uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you brought it up, but also like it's it's a shame because no one can actually buy them. They're just in, they're really impossible. Yeah. Fine now. I, they'll be back out again, but yeah, and it just shows you though how important the shape is and all that. Because when you get this, you kind of go, the shape works on anything, stainless steel, glass, etc. It's about the shape of it, and uh, and that's why it's good. And um, somebody said, obviously, the best glass is Denver and Lely, made whiskey approachable for my mum. That's priceless. That was Cavi, <laughs> that's, Cavi. Right. that's true. Yeah, but uh, yeah, they're really good. It's good, and you kind of get addicted to them after a while. You, can, you need to have one everywhere you go. There's um, there's also one done in there, which again, he, he doesn't have anymore. We'll plug all the glasses that he doesn't have. There's one done yeah, in kangaroo, great. <laughs> kangaroo leather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We use and the we ball do, sack of a kangaroo. It's awesome. We do all really pieces, soft by the way. We don't get given them for free. Um, <laughs> um, actually, a really funny story about this one here. I said uh, I was with Denver once and uh, I hadn't really used it much. And he said, oh, the good thing about the kangaroo leather is that uh, uh, it protects the glass inside. So if you throw it or drop it or something like that, it'll protect it. And he got my glass and he threw it on a table and it smashed. It's hard place, hard place. And it, and it, really, uh... and it, and it's specially engraved on the bottom. So it's not like I could get another yeah. glass. But the man no. did follow through with his word and go and get me a specifically engraved glass again done because he broke my glass. So quite funny. Um, <laughs> back to the whiskey. And that's why we have this one now. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one you can throw. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, just to go back a second, it's, it, that's not to shame anyone using a different glass. By the way, they're all they're 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 fit for different purposes, and I think I, I've certainly got Glen Cairns and Raymond Davidson when they set up Glen Cairn, like Denver, consulted with whiskey people, whiskey makers, what they would think was an all rounder glass. So it's it's it is a great glass for a reason. It's not just the marketing. So don't if you're using one of the glasses, we're not knocking that at all. Um, but it's it's good to have a regime of a few different. You know, I've got ISOs because I I love that too, Craig. I, I think it's a great neutral. Yeah. We bring glass in the, we bring in the spay urban spay glass to Australia, and um, again, you know, it's a heavy base glass. It reminds me more of a tumbler glass with more of a lip on it, so you do get those aromas. But um, was it again? You know, sold sold uh, marketed heavily, and uh, a lot of people you know go for, go for those types of glasses. But um, I think I think it's interesting that uh, the tumbler glass. I would imagine the 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 standard traditional tumbler glass is the glass everybody goes for because it's the most most approachable glass that generally would be in the cupboard at home. And again, you know, it was a glass. But was it a really good story? And I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, back when uh, World War Two ended. Uh, the three greatest powers in the world. I think it was Stalin, Truman, and um, Churchill all met up. Churchill. Uh, Churchill all met up in East Germany, and they sat there, and uh, I think the, what's his name? Uh, Churchill brought along a bottle of King's Ransom whiskey for them all to drink, and they didn't have any glasses there. And I think Stalin went away, and he got whiskey or vodka glasses from a box that he had, that he, that he brought with him. And he put them on the table and uh, they poured King's Ransom at the table and there was pictures taken of them all drinking from these glasses. And the glass that they used is a standard traditional um, glass, like a, a, just a tumbler glass. It was a heavy base glass that was round and they all drank out of that. And because the three most powerful men in the world were drinking out of that glass, everybody drank their whiskey from that glass. Wow. And that's how the tumbler glass basically was created as a whiskey glass because um, the three greatest powers of the world wanted to drink their whiskey from it when actually it was a vodka glass to start <laughs> it was a vodka glass exactly it was a um a crystal vodka glass that he'd brought across and he just happened to have it in his luggage yeah so they just got yeah. no. so, incredible yeah. good stories about glassware great story where's russia now though who's laughing now right <laughs> i'm not sure i think they're putting some stuff away somewhere Mm. Are they putting put, yeah, put in we, some stuff we, away? Yeah. Um, we promised we wouldn't bring it up, but it's a bit of a drinking game. That we did it, Denver. Bingo. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Craig. Yeah, okay. yeah. Open geopolitics. Let's go to Scotland then, okay? Yep. Glen Elgin. Uh, an under celebrated. Uh, but much loved, especially by whiskey nerds, uh, distillery. This is a distillery that's uh, in the town of Elgin, but um, is really known for being part of the White Horse blended scotch. Um, as you can see on the label, we've got a White Horse on there. Uh, we've got uh, the Elgin marbles uh, in one of the, the horse's satchels, and then we've got just some normal marbles. And as the labels have gone on batch by batch, we've had uh, more and more marbles, I think, dropping out of this gentleman's bag. That is Lord Elgin, I believe, in the red coat. Um, he's carrying a sword and he's got this white horse again. Um, going through a, a typical Scottish glen, although it's not anything what it looks like near the distillery, but it's just to, to give a, a scene. Um, and that's sort of, those are sort of all the boutique references on the label. The white horse bit is the bit I like the most. Um, and this is a, I, I don't know why in my mind this was what, where we were going to start because it's a, it's a great display, I think, of, especially when we're coming from three-year-old whiskeys um, from, from England, new, new craft distilleries. 12 is sort of a, 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 an equivalent, I, I, I think. A 12-year-old scotch in, in some ways is a very, parallel to a new uh, new distilleries three, especially a Jim Swan distilleries three. Um, these distilleries are generally uh, in Scotland aren't made to be bottled young. Glen Elgin is destined to be in Johnny Walker blue, of course, but also Johnny Walker uh, black. So 12 is the minimum they're, they're generally gonna bottle this at. Even when you see their own official bottlings, which are very rare and, and not that widely distributed, 
that's 12 as well. So Glen Elgin's destined to be 12. We wanted to bottle this. We bottled it uh, as a part of this series. Nice, clean, uh, like whiskey sponge and Serge Valentin, the whiskey, whiskey fun often say distillate forward style. That's exactly what you have here. It's a really intact uh, a Glen Elgin uh, in terms of flavor. And if you're familiar with Glen Elgin, then I think you'll recognize this for sure. Um, but it's it's got a nice approachable sweetness, maybe some raisins, things like that, uh, and a bit of herbal note. So one of the key blending benefits of Glen Elgin, um, and this is something that David Stewart told me, but also Jim Bever from Diageo, is this herbal parsley thyme type of thing. It lifts in blend. So especially when you put Glen Elgin against things like uh, Kalila, uh, it treats the smoke, mellows the smoke and gives it this sort of outdoorsy character. So it's a great blending ingredient because of that herbaceous uh, greenness. And uh, you know, it's something to maybe if you're a real nerd to try at home, take a bit of uh, the Hague Club that you never drink, put it in a glass, then add some of this, one drop of Kalila and four drops of Glen Elgin. Uh, and it really lifts the smoke, even just that tiny amount of smoke, it, it, it lifts it to, to being more, almost like in a forest with a fire in the distance, you know? So it is uh, an, an amazing alchemy that happens with, with blended scotch. And these things were developed over a long period of time. And, um, and I think Glen Elgin's one of those really reliable, always good uh, distillery. So when you see it from an indie, whether it's boutique or another, it's a safe bet if you're into this, into this, uh, this style. Um, on the palate, I think you taste that again, like we had on the Nicknean. It's quite similar, actually, I would think. Um, creamy and vanilla, uh, and then turning a bit, a bit fruity and even spicy, whether that's herb spice or uh, spice like cloves and cinnamon. There's, some, there's something else in there, I think, that develops over time. I should stop bullshitting and uh, or mine. Um, Sam, what's, uh, or Simon, what's pineapple cubs? Are they sort of like yellow bears? What's what? Uh, in the tasting notes? Vanilla cream and pineapple cubs are like baby sort of yellow bears. Oh, All right. I don't, I, don't, I don't know that one. This is, again, this is, uh, would have been Dave, our uh, ambassador to tasting notes. So it's probably a couple of UK references in there. Cubes. Pineapple cubes, the sweets. Okay, there we go. That makes more sense. <laughs> yeah, we put there yeah, Garibaldi right. biscuits are known as and it's full of fruit. So that that oh, so that, that they're the, the squeezy cubes, are they? The ones you know, that are coated in sugar? No, I think he means you know when you, you get a can of pineapple, those like just just chopped tinned pineapple. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, dull pineapple. Right. And it can. Okay. I get that. I get that. You know, you're raising yeah, a good that. point, though. It's so hard, even within the English speaking world, to do tasting notes that are truly universal. Yeah. 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 So, so we've got a different ignore, brand of English. Ignore these here. tasting notes. Yeah. I, I, ignore them, guys. F find yours. But this is really, this, 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 this cask is the DNA of Glen Elgin, I think. This is like a very pure, tidy, uh, 12 year old mature Glen Elgin. Great, great for blending. That's why we have, we have a bunch of these casts. I've used them in different whiskeys. Um, yeah, and they, they take sherry well. We've taken a lot of this parcel that we bought and put it into sherry hogsheads as well that we've released uh, recently. Uh, yes, I am a Kiwi. Pineapple lumps. I, I'm not getting so much of the chocolate, but definitely the, uh, the pineapple part of the pineapple lump. Um, it is it's one of my favorite tastes, you know, it's used in whiskey is pineapple lumps or perky nana is another uh, kiwi one I like to use. <laughs> is that a, a specific sweet or something or what is it? What's a lump? Yeah, it is. It's a song lyric? I don't really get if you're a kiwi. <laughs> Check it out. Check it out. Check out my perky nanas. <laughs> perky nana straight out of the freezer. It's a, it's a joy. Mm. <laughs> So for me, that's sippable at cast oh, yeah. at, at the bottling strength, but uh, you're very welcome to add water. And sometimes with water, people find Glen Elgin brings out sort of a, a bit of a rubber tire thing, which is intentional in the spirit. Uh, sulfur is not always a bad thing, although Jim Murray, who is a bad thing, 
um, has, has turned sulfur into a four letter word in a whiskey. Sulfur is actually quite desirable, especially from a blending perspective. But I think as much as a company like Glenmorangie, let's say, talks about their high stills and their, their fruity spirit, um, there is a sulfy, sulfury character that's really what adds this umami, this like thing in the background that you might not even register, but it adds some of the yummy, you know, um, a bit of a bit of that sulfur. And I think Glen, this Glen Elgin, well, I think all Glen Elgin has a bit of that uh, character as well. That, that's the word that, yummy, yummy. that introduces that. Is it a worm tubs are responsible for the sulfur? Probably so. In the case, yeah, that's so that's worth mentioning. Thanks, man. Uh, Glen Elgin is a uh, warm tub distillery, so it does have on, on half. Oh, wait, 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 they don't distill everything to the warm tub. Now I'm thinking, now I'm thinking about it because Glen Elgin, I think, changed. I think they make two styles, um, but yes, yeah, so the, the, the warm tubs instead of going through a shell and tube condenser, which is basically water running across a bunch of tubes and the vapor goes, uh, water running through a bunch of cold water running through a bunch of tubes and the vapor going around that and then recondensing. The, the worm tub is basically a, a pool of water with a pipe with the steam that slowly uh, goes through and then will will recondense uh, less uh, abruptly. And that carries over some of these sulfury notes, which are desirable. So some of the world's favorite whiskeys uh, uses Craig Allicky, Ben Rinnis, especially great blending whiskeys. Uh, Craig Allegy, Ben Rinnis, uh, Mortlock, yeah. um, all will use uh, warm tub condensers. These um these sulfur notes and the and the sort of um, herbaceous sort of qualities that lead well to the um, blends you mentioned before. What happens when um, they go into like a rich cask, say something like a sherry cask or whatever, sauternes or some sort of wine finish? What happens there? Does that all disappear? And then are, are these these beautiful sort of delicate spirits wasted in in those sort of barrels oh denver controversial it depends how you look at it right because i think i think a lot of people would think would say that a great classic coveted distillery like karazawa or mortlock are ruined by wood that the sherry masks all the beauty of the spirit now people love karazawa people spend forty thousand pounds on a bottle of this stuff now but when I worked at Sukinder's shop, the whiskey exchange, we had Karazawa on the shelf for 110 pounds. Fuck. And of course, I didn't know what it was going to be worth. Uh, yeah, I didn't work. know what it was going to be worth, but I refused to buy it even at staff price because it was just like licking wood. It was not, there was no spirit there at all. It was pencils, you know, it was just mahogany. What's the point of that? I thought at the time. Now I kick myself. <laughs> um, is, that, is that like when you saw Justin Bieber busking in Toronto you just thought that this is shit and then uh... well I, I thought it was cute I thought there was potential there and I thought it was a natural talent and I still get kickbacks he still he shares 7% of his profits which I'm very very grateful for uh, because of that, <laughs> that, that discovery that day Justin Bieber wow yeah but what, what, so like, what uh, yeah, just coming back to the series, it's a, uh, yeah, I was just saying, like, coming back to like, um, like cast finishing is all the all the rage, like, even in rye whiskey in the states, and um, all of this, it, it's even in beer. Like, tell me what's what's your thoughts on this, like, trend heading towards like kind of covering up the spirit a little bit. I it depends what the objective is. I so just to finish my point on the Karazawa and the Macallan. You might have heard of those distilleries. So I'm wrong. People love that. And yes, it might not be exactly what the distillate was like when it came out, but a big, beefy, old school Macallan and a sherry cask, that can't be beat. And now we know it's unrepeatable. It's never going to happen again. That Karazawa too, unrepeatable, never going to happen again. So yes, we might have missed some of the delicate fruit notes. Oh, no, I'm getting like, no, oh, the notes of nail polish are so lovely. Yeah, but we're also getting a great drink at the end. So there is a balance between what's a great drink and that's totally subjective and what's the distiller's intent. So it's nice to have independent bottlers. We mentioned Signatory, Boutique, any independent bottler bottling very naked uh, distillates, um, but a distiller and even a consumer, and I'm guilty of this too. I love a, a sherry bomb or a, a, a whiskey that's been 
um, really hit by a maker's mark barrel or an ex bourbon barrel or a para cask, that's a, just a pleasant drink. Now, I might not be getting all the nuance that the distiller wanted to be there, or it's possible as well that the alchemy of things that are happening is actually in turning that time into something else that is that is only achievable through that marriage of, of cask and spirit. So maybe maybe there's a massive benefit too that we're, we're the same. But is it a trend? I, it's, a, it's an ancient practice. I think people talk about cast finishing as being a new thing. It's happened forever. Like we had record, when I worked at Grants, we did a lot of research into this. It re-racking is hundreds of years old. So you would do it all the time, uh, partly because of leaky cask, but partly because of necessity. But uh, then, yeah, people, people thought in the 70s, uh, there's records of David Stewart pioneering this technique saying, yeah, let's put it into sherry. Let's put it into sherry. And that's where double wood and this whole phenomenon became a thing. So is it, I don't know if it's a, a trend. It's, it's another way to differentiate a product on a shelf. And Craig will see this. And any retailer will see this, right? If you, if you could have one Glen Elgin or four, if you're Glen Elgin, you want four. And you can do the Sotern cask and the Apera cask and the Your Mother's cask. And they're all going to taste slightly different. And there's another, you'll get someone buying your product maybe four times instead of once. Very good. Should we uh, uh, jump into some Blair Ethel? I see. All right. All right. Fuck, <laughs> yeah. It's been posted in the chat there by Craig. I think it was a bit of a hint. Nick's whiskey. Craig, Craig who? <laughs> I love. So look, the, 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 the scotches we've included in each of our themed releases in the Home Nations uh, Rye series and the Oz series. Uh, in the upcoming Boutique Records or the Norwest Euro Express, which is coming out this week, this week. include some um, scotch. So in the theme, there's whiskeys that are part of the theme, and then we do some sexy scotches too. So these are, these are the scotches. So that Blair Ethel, uh, like Glen Elgin, is a great blending whiskey. You don't see it a lot as a, as a single. Um, beautiful distillery to visit. When I lived in Edinburgh, it was somewhere I would go regularly to up to Pit Locker with buddies, because if you were taking a whiskey group or even a not a whiskey group up into the highlands. It's an easy train ride. So if you're ever there, I really recommend it. Easy train ride, beautiful little touristy town. Um, but you can visit Blair Ethel, get a, get a little buzz on, and then walk through the forest to Edradour, one, one of the smallest distilleries in Scotland. Yeah. You'll see deers in the forest often. There's a waterfall, really beautiful little hike. Um, and a lovely pit stop, you know, on the way up into the Highlands and the space side. So not something to miss, but it's a, it's a big part of the Bell's family of blended whiskeys. Um, and it's an awesome distillery, I think, uh, in its own right. You can see right there in the image, um, Blair Athel, and right there in the image, um, the Bell's in uh, being um, cut from bushes there, topiary. Uh, hinting at the association, the long association that Blair Ethel as a distillate has had with, with Bell's blended scotch. Um, I don't know who the guy is, the guy with the beard, unfortunately. I don't have any notes on that, but um, he's someone. Uh, and each subsequent release, there's always a little difference in the label. Uh, the most recent one has autumnal colors uh, in the green. Uh, we've had different words inside this area. If you can see my cursor, we've had different uh, flora and fauna in the background because Blair Ethel is one of the Diageo flora and fauna releases. Uh, so there's various flora and fauna about. This is also, uh, this was bef released before we started putting the NCS, the nearly cast strength up in the corner. This is a natural cast strength whiskey bottled at 60.2 after 21 years of maturation. Wow, right? That's cool. That's unusual um, to last that long and still hold such a high alcohol by volume naturally. These are just refill hoggies. Again, a distillate forward Blair Ethel, um, uh, the kind of thing that we love to include in our releases, uh, especially if we know in subsequent releases we're going to be doing a heavily sherried Blair Ethel. We like to do an AB uh, throughout the year if possible. So, um, Glen Elgin clear works. So when they uh, do their mash, the liquid that comes off is clear. Here, the liquid is cloudy. And that has a, some effect on the type of flavors 
that you're gonna be able to extract through fermentation. Glenelgin has a famously long fermentation. Blair ethyl, famously short. So creating a very nutty uh, style of, of uh, distillate because that fermentation time really only lets, it's great, great for brewing, really lets that almondy, nutty, walnut thing come through. But also um, the, the, the stills then after that and the short distillation uh, adds real uh, weight and makes it a, a meaty, what's no, so Blair ethyl would be classed in the Diageo group of blends as a nutty, meaty style, uh, like Mortlock and uh, things like that. Uh, so I've always loved Blair ethyl. Let's get that in my glass. And to have a 21 year old at such high ABV that still shows the distillery uh, character intact, I think is pretty cool. Woo, punchy, strong, you yeah. can add water. Again, I think Denver's glass really helps, uh, especially with time with that wide surface area and so being selective where you know helps. But if you're on a Glencairn or something else, just, just sort of waft it, be gentle. Don't stick your nose right in there. Um, and then if you'd like, especially for the palate, it's probably worth adding a drop of water. Yeah, this, this is a real standout. I did a tasting at the yeah. uh, Elysian on Tuesday night, a real standout in the tasting. Really a real cracker. Agreed, bud. And I, I think an interesting thing, and it's worth remembering for everyone on a tasting like this, is context is everything. I think if we had this first, we might find it abrasive or briny or, you know, it, it's, your palate needs to be awake to appreciate all that's going on in here. First of all, because the age uh, and the oxygen interplay, um, but also because it is quite a plain, there's not a super active task. Oxygen is doing most of the work here. And uh, this is right up my street. Love this. Yeah. It, I mean, it sort of has this garden center thing to me where you get a bit of, you know, you get a bit of wood, but also like there's plants, there's greenery around, mm. there's flowers, there's apples and pears, and maybe there's even like a, the, the, the garden center cafe in the background with like a coffee thing. It, yeah, yeah it feels like to me, like if I was visualizing, you're inside like an indoor nursery. Yeah, 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 totally. It's like this dankness, it's like wet, wet rock or something. And there's then all the plants that are in there. It's just, this is pretty, this is probably the most complex whiskey we've had tonight um, by far. It's like, it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Well, just Craig, actually, like I'm just, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask, but how much is this per bottle? I think yeah. I need, probably need a bottle of this. This is pretty good. I'm not going to tell anybody I'm going to grab a bottle. I'm going to grab a bottle myself. <laughs> um, was, uh, it's actually pretty good. I don't usually do that after a tasting. Um, I'm pretty impressed. Two forty nine for for this for a twenty one year old. It's good. It's pretty uh, pretty amazing. Casket, heavy cast strength, but yeah, really really pleased. But I'm I'm not. I'm saying this I'm not a big Blair Atwood fan. I am. Um, I've been heavily impressed with stuff that they've done. In, uh, that's the regular releases from the distillery, but um, this, however, is terrific. Yeah, really like it. So was the finish of Blair Atwood. I've never never enjoyed. This has got a great finish as well. Yeah, it's unfortunate, isn't it, I, I, Craig? I think that a lot of the official releases of some of these great blending scotches from Diageo, they just aren't great. And I know they've tried to launch Mortlock several times, mm -hmm. and it's a great distillery. And some of the best whiskeys I've ever had have been independently bottled McPhail and other um, Mortlocks. Mm -hmm. But the proprietary bottlings, for, for whatever reason, they just don't live up to it somehow. Maybe because they're using more casts. I, I don't. I don't know how it happens. But that's. I mean, look. That's one of the funds of something like boutique and something like any independent bottler is that you can you can really narrow down primary pigments and find little gems uh, that showcase the distillery properly. I think. Oh yeah, that is right up my street. My God. Oh. Nine fifty in the morning, people. There goes my day. Just getting started. <laughs> Warming up, that open the full bowl. <laughs> I might, yeah, I might put my out of office on and just stay with you guys for the next couple of hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah I hope, I'm glad hope you enjoy that. Though, this, it's, Craig, it's it's very good. It's very good. We'll have to see if there's more um, around as well. Mm, yeah, yeah. We we also I mean, we had the Brickladdy on the, this uh, import as well. You know, he gave us the Brickladdy, yeah. and uh, we tasted that and like we rated it exceptionally highly. 
you know, because it was an exceptional Brooklarian where we thought that was the best of the bunch. And uh, I didn't taste this one. It was actually one of my colleagues that tasted it and did the notes on it. And uh, he rated it an 8.8 .8 out of 10. And uh, I think it should be higher because <laughs> that's really good. Yeah, yeah. the, the, the Brooklady was 9.2. There you go. There you go. Who was it who did the writing? Was it Liam? Was it? Uh, An Anton, we've got a new guy in the office okay. at the moment, Anton, and uh, he's doing all the, the, the notes right now. So um, yeah. he's doing a good job, but yeah, not sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> Very good. Mm. Nervous now. I'm nervous to move on because it's another un, unsung hero, undersung, I would say, a big part of the JMB. If you're ready to move on, we can go to, because I'm conscious of time, um, we can go to Strathmill, which is almost the opposite of this whiskey, I think I might say. I don't want to set you up too much. Let's let's get in our glass and try to be objective. But there's a great reason why we included what we included in the in the outturn. Like like Craig was saying, the Brooklady he mentioned, very wood influence, but still totally Brooklady. Great age, um, an old Strath Mill, not something you see a lot of. An old Blair Ethel at such high strength. The Glen Elgin, really plain cast, so woody stuff. And very, very distillate forward, a good mix in our Scotch uh, releases from the Home Nation series. The Strathmill falls on the opposite side of the first two we just had. This is a wood driven uh, Strathmill. So let's share my screen again, give you some details. Here's another one sec as I've lost. I'm, I'm very excited about this. I, ha I have tried this before and uh, I'm it's an awesome whiskey to finish on, Simon. So good choice. Whoever thought of that finishing on that's just genius. Absolutely genius. That, that, was, that was, all, was all Craig. This is this is a place to end. Yeah, nice man. Oh god, I can smell that in my glass. All right. So yeah, that's this is, mm. Yes, it's exactly. So exactly. Let's look at the label. Um Strathmill, as the name uh implies, it's uh a space side whiskey, the Strathspey, uh, and was a mill. Uh, it, it started its life as a a mill for poor jotes. Um, and then we've got Goldilocks, widely associated, wrongly or rightly, with porridge. Poor Goldilocks. Um, so Goldilocks on there, uh, on the label, uh, trying one of three bowls. The warm one, the, the, not, the, the perfect, the one that's just right, or the one that's too hot, I'm not sure. Um, there's also, what's that on the table? Is that Gilby's gin? Because uh, Gilby um, bought the distillery in 1895 and then changed the name from its original name uh, to Strath Isla. It was called Glen Isla originally, um, but a big part of the JMB family, JMB uh, was became popular really in the era right after prohibition um, as a, a light whiskey is what it was called, light blended scotch that was light. Uh, it was fashionable to not have dark spirits, uh, not, not clear spirits necessarily. It wasn't the age of cocaine and vodka, but it, it, darker whiskeys were seen to be impure some, for some reason uh, and less, less uh, gentile, you know? So um, JMB was part of that light whiskey brigade like Cuddy Sark and others. Sark, um, yeah. Oh, there's Cuddy, yeah, exactly. But certainly nothing like uh, um, flavorless. Light did not mean flavorless. Light, light was more about the color and using plain casts and having distillate forward. Uh, and old J&Bs or old cutties like uh, Simon has, getting your hands on some of those, they're absolutely stunning drinks. Um, and so Strathmill is one of the distillers that helped build that uh, reputation. It's a real fruity style of whiskey to begin with, but I think this, this cask, this sherry butt only amplifies that and with the more dried fruits and, and things like that, currants and other things like that. Um, you can see just from the ABV uh, and also from the outturn, there were massive losses on this butt. A sherry butt is 500 liters when it's filled. Um, the fact that we have 400 bottles 
means that there are probably around 200 leaders remaining. So that's a massive angel share. That hurts us cost-wise, obviously, um, but often that leads to a more interesting whiskey. So the angels aren't the only ones who steal from casks. So working at Glenfiddich and Balvenie for years, I can tell you the casks <laughs> that were mostly empty, were all, there was always a reason because the lads at the distillery thought they were killer. So um, this is a reality. And I think that a cast like this, that it comes to us so low, implies that it was a yummy one at the distillery or at the storage facility. Um, so that's fortunate. So I always love when we see low outturns. Yes, it often means the per liter cost is going to be very high to us. But I always want to see those samples when we see them from our brokers or from the distillers, because there might be a reason, you know. Um, the other cool thing is when a whiskey, I think, falls naturally excuse me, below 50%, that's when the real psychedelic crazy shit starts happening chemically. Um, when the water alcohol ratio becomes imbalanced, that's when you start getting in old McAllen's, as we've mentioned, or old Kurosawa's, or old Klein Leashes, or old Linkwoods. That's when you start getting this crazy floral effects in some of those distillates. That's when you start getting these really insane tropical fruits uh, in old Laphroaig's when they start getting below, naturally below 50%. And so that's another reason that a cast like this, I was like, ooh, you know, I think when we bought it, it was at 51, to be honest. Um, but casts around that strength with low uh, volume, I always want to see those because there's a chance that they're absolutely banging. And I think that's the case with this one. I hope you like it. Um, oh, no, mine's already in my glass. Excuse me. So you can see much darker color, totally different than the distillate forward whiskeys we've had previously. And to those people who like that, I think there's some comments already. Uh, let me get the comments happening again. Technical genius. Mm, that's lovely. Yeah, I'm a fan of this style as well. But it's a different thing, isn't it? Where, where's my chat gone? There it is. Ignore me. I see it now. Yeah, fudgy, chocolate, yeah, all of that, guys. Um, is that I'm getting like uh, intense Garibaldi biscuits, actually. <laughs> it, you, it, you, it turns out you can teach an old dog new tricks. Wow, you've learned something new today. Yeah, just, just the insides of the Garibaldis. Um, yeah, really, really nice. Those, those raisins, it's really taking me back. But I, I really like the um, the it's not over sherry. I think that's that's seems to be a thing um, that I've I've noticed a couple of times. So there's some stuff that's coming out, and you should have just bought sherry. Um, but this is this is beautifully balanced, really like a bit of a symphony, almost. So it's it's really really nice. Nice, yeah. I love I love the label, but I, I think this also this whiskey, a 22 year old Strathmill big sherry bomb that still has whiskey taste you're absolutely right it's not that's something to mention for all if there is anyone on this call who is a sherry bomb seeker get into sherry it helps the whiskey industry um but sherry is an amazing drink really rich history and crazily affordable totally undervalued um and when you have that craving and you're like oh where's my McAllen? where's my glenn farkless where's my abel arabuna where's my darkness um, sometimes just grab, just have a sherry. It's, it's a, it, it ticks that box when you're craving that yeasty dried fruit thing. It's just nothing else. Can, sherry does it better than a sherry whiskey. So if you're a whiskey drinker, who's fallen in love with sherry casks, chances are you're going to love sherry too. So I, I really recommend getting into it. So it's, it's a brilliant drink that, um, again, you know, sell, selling more bottles of sherry, I don't think Craig's going to fight that, but also uh, it helps, it helps whiskey. We, we're so dependent on the, the sherry cask bit of that industry. Eccles Ooh. cake. Nice. Eccles cakes is another, that, that's, that, <laughs> that's the joke, um, I guess, with the Gary Baldies. Mm. When they produce sherry though, yeah, so if they're producing more sherry because we're drinking more sherry, do they not just keep the casks? Because they don't get rid of the casks. They keep them for a hundred years. Do they not? But they keep using so the same cask? So in there, yeah. So I, mo most of the stuff that it ends up as our drinking sherry is kept, yeah, for a very long time. But I mean, for example, we just bought 300 year old, not 300 years, three times uh, 100 year old sherry 
uh, butts that have been in Solera systems for the past hundred years. And uh, they're hideous to look at. But fuck, when you stick, you stick your nose in there, it's absolute heaven. And it, we're going to put things like McAllen and Ardbeg, but McAllen's known for that old sherry style. Mm-hmm. We're going to put some of that in those, in those ancient, uh, ancient casks because they do, they do release them regularly. We also buy old ones because they don't last forever. And sometimes they're surplus to a, to a company's requirement, mm-hmm. um, but they're coveted, obviously. Um, so yeah, we, we bought a few of those and we use some of them for our octaves for darkness as well. So we, we sometimes get old, uh, tired or retired, um, uh, bodega butts that we re our guys in Spain recut into smaller casts so we can use four different times for, uh, for sharing octaves as well. So these old, these old things are, are sex, but you're absolutely right. They're, they're not the things that end up most widely these days on, mm. on the market as, uh, for, for sherry fillings, for whiskey fillings. Have you bought many casks from Australia? Like, because I know that a lot of wineries here have lo- massive big casks that Sherry's been sitting in for a you know, hundred years. And have have you ventured over here to pick some of those casks? Or now, now he will. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're, they're everywhere. <laughs> Huge. No, it's a great massive, idea. Massive things, and then the, the Sherry's been sitting in them, or a para has been sitting in them for hundred years. You know, just kept, kept getting refilled. And when you walk down into these cellars, the smell of it is amazing, you know, and you think that's wasted down here. That needs to be a whiskey cask. <laughs> yeah, it's a great show. I don't know, Simon, let's 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 start that. Yep. I mean, it's a yep. great show. We wouldn't be able to see a sherry cask, but it would who cares? It'll do the flavor that we're after. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. To 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 yeah, build, yeah. I think they have massive big sherry vats, you know, and, and wood and yeah, amazing. That's what you need. Muscat's the big thing as well. Lots of um, lots of old muscat casts. Hmm. Yeah, everywhere. I noticed. Uh, yeah, like Lark brought out one of them recently. Muscat. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to see that. Um, yeah, at this this uh, Strathmore was um, one of the big hits at uh, Whiskey Abbey. It was incredibly popular. Um, yeah, absolutely right. This tram. We've got a little bit of stock left of this. We we'll try and yeah. get some more down here. I think. Mm. I'm, I'm getting in a bottle yeah i don't know how it plays out in, in uh, oz dollars but this is also i think 22 year old heavily shared whiskey from a distillery we don't often see it's also pretty good pretty decent value um we, tr- we try to keep it that way you know whiskey prices are going insane i saw a whiskey list yesterday from one of our brokers that would blow your head. I mean, it, 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 it the prices that we are being offered cast now would result in bottles that were, you know, 15 to 18 years old and close to 500 pounds a bottle. So wow. something, something is wrong and it's hopefully not going to last too long. Um, fortunately, we have, you know, a massive inventory because we invested years ago, but it's, it's frightening to see what the future is going to bring. I just, I just saw a Douglas Lang release come on to Master of Malt yesterday reflecting some of this problem so another independent bottler if you don't mind me speaking about them simon um but it appeared on master of malt um a 12 year old calila for 102 pounds so wow clearly they've had to buy that cask for a massively inflated price maybe because of the demand yeah but or just investment class whiskey you know all those ads you get on instagram and social media but invest in whiskey well mark jason anthony greg john don't do it. There's, there's no, unless you know how to liquidate it, it's like just buying raw gold. What are you going to do with that? The raw oil, crude oil. If you don't know how to turn it into something, it's actually valueless. And these guarantees that people are promising, it's driving up the price. It's going to, it's going to affect the consumer. It's already happening. Um, and it's artificial. There's going to be a collapse. And for an industry we love, uh, I think it'd be a real shame to play, to play a part in that. Cause there, there, there's no, there will be no one, except for the, the companies themselves, I guess, who wins in that scenario. Um, but shocking, yeah, some of the, the prices that we're seeing for just standard sort of 15-year-old, 18-year-old whiskeys. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen that as well, but um, I've been sort of told by a couple of independent bottlers that um, because they've been in the industry for a while and they've got good contacts, they buy barrels at a certain price. And like you said, they know what to do with them. But when they go to some of these auctions, some of these independent bottlers are buying these barrels for just a ridiculous price. And then they're putting fancy labels on them and selling them for a really high price. And you're like, oh, it's just, you know, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's so hard to see because um, 
yeah, like the prices are just yeah, like going up and up and up. And yeah, I'm not sure like the lot of the juice is just the exact same as what, what the other guys would bring out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but look, what one that's one bit of it, right? Is that one part of the bubble is these premium bottlings. If you have a customer who's going to spend a thousand pounds on an 18 year old Strathmill and because you because you put it in a nice bottle, then good for you. That's that's cool. I mean, we'd all love to have a business where we have that customer base, I suppose. The problem I, I see is the casks, the raw materials. If the yeah. cask itself is costing 500 pounds per liter, you know, 25,000 pounds for, per cask, unless you have that customer, which is almost unheard of, um, what are you going to do with that at the end? And oh, the guaranteed 40% returns year on year. What are you talking about? That's that's never going to be realized. The chances of you realizing that are so low. You're stealing people's money. And it's real, it's it's kind of sad. Um yeah, but yeah, it, look, expensive whiskeys exist. That's cool. I, I bought expensive whiskey. We know Karazawa, I thought was expensive. <laughs> 10 pounds. I think staff price was 80. And I was like, nah, it's too much. Same with Lord of the Isles. Sukinder said I could buy. He gave me, he said, I'll let you buy Lord of the Isles. It's for my brother's birthday. Oh, yeah, okay. For 100 pounds. Nope, didn't do it. 100 pounds. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oops. Uh... <laughs> oh, that's way too much that's way too much just whiskey man just a bottle of booze why would i buy that yeah wow and then i was at sakinda's show and i had to like give three tokens or something to have like a dram of that <laughs> yeah angus pays his rent on that kind of shit <laughs> insane well, great i don't know if we open the floor or wrap up or yeah denver we about to go ahead oh no just saying insane like where where the industry is going it's <laughs> And I, I feel like the, the change is accelerating over time. Like, I feel like it was a slower change, like maybe five years ago, 10 years ago. And now it's starting to like just accelerated change in different directions. And I think that's, it brings a lot of color and diversity and, and diversifies the product. But then I just hope that people can get the foundation education um, without getting priced out. That, that I could at when I was younger. So like that I can, I've, I've tasted a lot of things and then I can taste all these other things and have an appreciation for them. But like, if you never get to taste the foundation things at, at 12 years, yeah. like it's, it's ridiculous, yeah. absolutely ridiculous. So yeah, I just hope people don't support that so much, but you know, we can't really talk for the, the full customer base the people that are just collecting stuff. And there was actually a good discussion. I would like to bring this to the to the forum here. Give me, um, give me, give me a second. About packaging. Oh, de- 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 give me Sorry. a second. I just thought everybody, it's, it is nine o'clock. We are into question time. Um, what was it? So if people do want to leave now, you're welcome to leave. We're obviously finished the whiskeys. Thank you very much. And I hope you've enjoyed. You're welcome to hang around. We're going to ask some questions. We're going to talk whiskey. We're going to talk, like we just said, some marketing, etc. And we'll, we'll be about for a while. So you can hang about and uh, sit on here for as long as you want until I guess we've had enough. Um, but thank you if you don't want to hang around and you want to leave for the evening thank you very much for your support we have a gin tasting coming up in two weeks with Edinburgh Gin Company which is going to be great you get a cocktail inside your pack sent to you uh, and uh, some garnish as well to garnish your cocktail uh, and also five gins and in the week after that we've also got a St Paddy's a pre-St Paddy's Day tasting of Hyde Whiskey That'll be, jump, that'll be on the website tomorrow and it will be sent out in a newsletter as well. So that'll be a great tasting. It's all the way from Ireland. They'll be celebrating. They'll have green on. They'll probably have strange hats and glasses on and all that sort of stuff. But um, we'll have a bit of fun with that one. Uh, but thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Sam and Denver uh, for your time and as well as Simon for his time. Um, like I said, hang around, ask some questions. Hopefully we'll get some gory stuff out of these guys. Um, <laughs> that's what we want. We want everybody to hang around so we can put pressure on them to tell us a little bit about something in the industry that we don't already know. Uh, but uh, I'll hand it back over to you, Denver, to continue what you were going to talk about, if you can remember. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember, I can remember. I was just thinking about the gory stuff. But um I, um, I'm going to have one more drum. I'm going to fly up to Sydney and I'll see Simon actually tomorrow um, in the morning. But um, I'm going to have one more dram. Um, and this one's a bit of a, a nod to old Sambo over there, um, which is a Balvenie um, triple cast 25 year old. Um, so I'm just going to have one more dram to him and also to um, the malt master. And thank you, Craig and Simon and Sam for having me on. Uh, I didn't actually contribute that much, but you know, 
I got to hang around. So that's kind of cool. Um, so I've got, uh, my question was actually about, so during the week there was a discussion in an Australian whiskey forum about um, packaging and how the packaging of more expensive bottles is getting more and more elaborate. Um, and someone brought up the point that, and I'm, I'm interested to see what you think, yay or nay or whatever, um, but just your thoughts on it. Is it because that people, the collectors now, are just collecting the whiskey and putting it on the shelf as art rather than actually drinking the whiskey? Because in a lot of cases, these um, these hyper expensive bottles with the amazing packaging aren't actually that good. Thoughts? Some of them are. What incredible accusations, Deborah. Have you tried? Have you tried any of these things that you're you're slandering? I'm not. I'm not slandering. I'm just, I just said there was a question that was in the in the forum. No, no, it's, yeah, um, it's fair. McCallan, eighty-one year old. I take you've crashed your bottle of that. <laughs> no, we got we got we were lucky enough. Um, I was doing some work for Edrington um, over in in Scotland, and we got to try a whole bunch of stuff. And really, the range only, in in my opinion, like it only really starts at rare cask. I don't really didn't really taste anything below that. That was. And they, in the in the same portfolio, and we shouldn't really get too deep into this, but um, otherwise it could affect my business sort of relationships. But like within the company, they knew that um, Glen Rothes is an incredible whiskey for the money, um, and and McAllen seems to be this massive marketing tool that just like absolutely you know kicks ass regardless of what they release. The older it is, doesn't it doesn't matter, but. Um, yeah, what's your thoughts on this? What's your thoughts on the packaging and these hyper-aged whiskies that have um, just they've spent a lot of money on the packaging? And is is that because it it now is art? And then I would love, and there's a secondary part which I'm going to talk about NFTs, but I don't know if you guys know that much about that. But um, yeah. Anyway, let's talk about this first part. Your question then, if you're even venturing into NFT and you're talking about whiskey quality and age and packaging, your question is about value. So there's an yes. exchange of currency for something of perceived value. So that's a complicated array of things to get into. Craig, also, you don't have to twist my arm to, to share tidbits. We're fuck, we can be, we're pretty transparent, <laughs> as you can tell from the last hour or however long we've been going on. I'll tell you something. A lot, of, a lot of questions have been: Are there any news about um, a, more Australian casks coming out with tiki whiskey? That's what they all <laughs> want to know. So that's what you've got to tell us. <laughs> I think I've already accidentally said that today. <laughs> you shouldn't have said it as well. It's not. It's it's definitely top secret news still. <laughs> I I don't even know the full. I haven't even been told the full lineup yet. But you've been told some of the lineup. Is that what you're telling us? Yes, I, I, I've been I've been involved in a couple of dis uh, discussions and intros. Can you describe? Yeah, we're just label? we're just tasting casks. We don't have enough for. Yeah. Can you describe the front label, the, the label in the bottle to some of us? <laughs> we're not that far. We're just exploring it. We're just exploring it as a possibility because last year's was so successful uh, <laughs> that we're exploring doing it again. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we, we have had a quick chat about uh, some potential label ideas, which I won't get into. I won't, won't give any of that away, but I, I can't wait to see see the new labels. Mm. Very excited. I mean, the, 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 I actually find a lot of our new world distilleries, a lot of the craft distilleries where the magic really happens. There's so much to tell about each of the distilleries. Um, there's yeah, some really fantastic labels. And you, I just love that the uh, you know, each of the distillers kind of get involved in that storytelling and, and are so excited to see that artwork come to life. Mm. So yeah, some really, some, um, it's going to be exciting. It'll be, well, we should see these uh, in Australia towards the end of the year. What, what, um, what, what interests me about uh, some Australian distillery, well, one in particular, is um, that we never see anything from. Uh, and I wondered if you had any contact with them and had spoken to them about doing something with them and they've maybe said no or you know they're unsure but lime burners don't ever seem to do anything so they just seem to be like they've won so many awards and like we talk about Sullivan's Cove winning good awards lime burners has won some of the biggest awards in the world for their whiskey and we never hear about them <laughs> and nobody ever independently bottles them or does anything so I, I, I can't comment on that maybe Sam <laughs> Sam can <laughs> 
but I, I, I know that that, that is uh, you know, something that our cast buyer, Felix, was, was looking into. Whether he had any success, I, I, I don't know. But yeah, so, I mean, in, in our first um, Australian series, we had a quite a nice sort of spread. We had two from Tassie, two from South Australia, two from Victoria, two from New South Wales. So we haven't done a whiskey from WA yet. Mm. Um, at Queensland and, and NT, obviously, not, not in there yet. But um, yeah, I would, I would love to see some WA. We have worked with WA distilleries before with Boutique Gin, Old mm. Young's, we did a bottling with under Boutique Gin. Mm. But um, not whiskey yet. Sam is not saying anything. <laughs> I can feel you kicking me under the table. No, but great question, Craig. Wouldn't that be amazing? It would yeah. be amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Some, somebody should do it. Yeah. Somebody should. Yep. And, no, and, feel design, like, and design a really cool label, cool label as well. <laughs> that's it. I mean, uh, the thing that got me really pumped about the Australian series is we managed to beat SMWS by a few months. Um, <laughs> the, that was amazing and I'm a big fan of SMWS and, and Matt Bailey is a great guy but just it was great to beat them <laughs> that was, that definitely was the competition uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. definitely that's good and actually that, and that's the other thing is that um, I guess with, with lime burners and I think what I've noticed in Australia is the difference between the whiskey from when they first, I guess, started out, maybe let's say eight years ago for guys like Lime Burners and Lark, et cetera, uh, to now, you know, you've got that, you've got the consistency coming now, but I find that the single casks that they do still don't meet what they were doing eight years ago. Like yeah. the Lime Burners, single, the, the casks that were bringing out single casks and the Lark single casks, I've got a ton of them there because they, they were great. And then you go, they're just not hitting that mark. You know, you just wonder why not? What's the? Is it the wood? Can't they find the wood? Are they rushing things? Are they? You know, it's 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 yeah, peculiar. Hmm. Do I dare come back? Do you think the same Denver? Like, do you think the same Denver? The single casks, um, guys like Lark and Lime Burners and stuff like that, they're not sort of hitting the market they did eight years ago. Whereas the yeah, it's the, uh, the, I the guess your stuff is more consistent. Well, I guess this is a controversial part of the evening, I suppose. So you can just say whatever you want. But <laughs> the um, yeah, definitely, I think Lime Burn has kind of missed the mark. Uh, well, the original sort of um, single casts were really good, and but they had a lot of inconsistency in their standards, uh, their core product. Hmm. Um, the Lark, I yeah, I kind of agree. Um, Lark has gone a different direction because now they're a publicly listed company, so you've got to answer to a board and you need to continually make a profit for the people that are um, invested in your company. So um, I think it's a different focus now. It shouldn't be seen as um, what it was um, three, four years ago before they're publicly listed. So I think um, it's a whole different beast now. So I, like it's the whiskey doesn't, I don't think the whiskeys should really relate to what the whiskeys were before. Um, so yeah, you shouldn't be looking at, at Lark for that sort of thing anymore, I, I would say. Personally. I, I, I did. Um, Sam, um, I did message our uh, cast by Felix uh, last week with the news that came about about the Lark CEO who stepped down um, and was joking. If we <laughs> Mr. Did, Crap Five, we yeah. have a cask of Lark. Uh, we needed to include some sort of glass still design on the label. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, no, I, I, I not neither confirm nor deny if we have any Lark. That's. Uh, Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And then the share price went up in smoke as well, yeah? <laughs> I, 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 I need the drums. Doing pretty well, though. <laughs> doing pretty well. Um, Sam, in the, U in the UK then, you know, you're obviously out there trying different whiskies, etc. Um, of the new distilleries that, have, that are there, what would you say were your, I guess, handful of favourites that have opened up and are now producing single malt now what's what would you say was your uh well it's first worth noting that you know we bottled australian whiskeys because i think australia is making some of the best whiskeys in the world right now yeah. and yeah that's an honest opinion and i think totally fair we tasted blind uh some samples we had like sexy old mortlocks and 
some cool scotches uh, that, that Toby had brought in and Felix brought in samples from his first trip to Australia a couple of years ago. Mm. And three-year-old, five-year-old whiskeys all matched them head to head. Mm. And they were interesting. And as you dug into them, as Simon implied earlier, and got some of the place, the stories, it was even more intoxicating or, you know, more, more exciting. You, it's so easy to become enthusiastic about the people and the, uh, the whole stories of the distillery it was just it was, there was so much there, and that's what that's what whiskey is about. It's so much more than than just a product or an age statement or a fancy box, like uh, Denver was saying. There's 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 the people behind it and visiting the place and seeing the tin shed or seeing someone turn shit into a peaty whiskey or a smoky whiskey. You know, it's it's incredible, and and those stories are abundant in, in Australia. So I think Australia is one of the places that I look to for exciting. Uh, new things and the, the future of, of whiskey and the new you know hierarchical order of scotch at the top uh, i think oz is going to be pretty near that top very quickly yeah. but within the uk yeah england i mean england's been overlooked for ages yeah. especially within the uk because oh no it's all about scotch and by the english the english english people say no no i wouldn't wouldn't buy an english whiskey but saint george i mean we, we bottled the 12 year old but has been producing amazing whiskey for you know well over a decade and is i think still underrated but are the new ones um lakes uh interesting approach to whiskey up there viewing as i do the whole world as a palette and blending world whiskeys together but also producing a great distillate themselves mm -hmm. that they're trying different things with and producing different styles um i the thompson's they're interesting family business up in the highlands um to begin with, but also producing like, is it going to be great whiskey? I'm not sure, but it's certainly interesting and certainly a conversation starter and certainly small scale and cool. Like they're doing everything right. They're never going to be able to sell, uh, I don't think, uh, tens of thousands or even thousands maybe of, of uh, their own bottlings. Um, they're not producing that much, but it's a cool story. They're into it for the right reasons. They're, they're lovely people. Um, and I can't wait to see what else they bring out. Uh, Sam, Sam, we've got a question here. What's your view on Bimba? <laughs> well, the word Bimber itself sounds like a derogatory term for someone who would release that many whiskeys in a single year. Right? <laughs> you're, being a, you're being a Bimba, mate. Don't be a Bimba. <laughs> It sounds, you know what I mean? It sounds like something you'd call, don't be a doofus. Don't be a bimber. I don't know. I, so again, not, nice people, cool distillery. The spirits I've tried have been yummy. There's far too much of it out there. I think there's, it's, it's, it's over, it's, it's expensive, um, which is fine. I think expensive is fine, but it's hard. How, what are they preparing themselves for? How's that going to be? Um, how's that going to endure? I just see it. I see a, a challenge in the future of a lot of bimbers on a lot of shelves people are buying them and flipping them at auction for less than they were sold for um no one's opening them so it sort of relates back to denver's question if whiskeys especially on a large scale aren't being opened that's a problem if 80 bottles of something that comes in a fancy box aren't being all opened that's fine because it's 80 bottles it's not wasteful it's like if you're into shoe collecting denver nike mag or you know all, i'm not oh, yeah. a big you are so you you get boxes. Yeah, Jordan ones. Yeah. yeah, but they they've they've done Ben and Jerry partnerships with funny boxes. Like there's lots, there's lots of examples, I think, of um shoes that are never going to be worn. Does that make them less valuable or less less sneakers? No. So the whiskeys are no less for being on someone's shelf. They still exist and they're they're an artifact of history. Um you're breaking up a bit, but I think you're nodding. Denver's, uh, yeah, slowing down there. I tried to answer every question in one there. Sorry. Yeah, I was getting your point. Now, well, I, I wear all my sneakers, so I don't want to, like, the, the, I think the crying shame is that imagine you died and you never got to wear your sneakers or you never got to taste that whiskey that you, like, spent so much money on. Then what happens to it? You just looked at it in a bottle. You never got to taste that craft and that age and the um and the care that these the staff put into it. I think I don't maybe it's because like my visits to distilleries and things like that, that like I, I have that 
appreciation for that the, the staff and what they do and not just that price tag there's there's way more to it um and so then i have to i have to taste those whiskies like regardless of how expensive they are if i if i can afford it i'll buy it um otherwise i'll just you know i'll get it on someone else's tabs like 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 sam's that'd be good you know how generous i am denver <laughs> Uh, yeah, I get, but, but that's yeah. up to, I mean, that's up to the buyer, isn't it? So I'm, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure there are some, uh, uh, let's remind you of one story and Craig, you'll remember this from, uh, I don't know how long ago it was, but in Scotland, uh, there was a guy, I don't know, it might've been in London actually, excuse me that this guy, this happened, but anyway, one of the first like, whoa, that's expensive bottles, a Dalmore, whatever it was. And it wasn't, I mean, from today's standards, it was like, you know, it was like 7,000 pounds which by, from today's standards is like nothing, but it was a lot of money for a, for a single bottle of whiskey, whatever it was. And the gentleman bought it and opened it with, with people in a, in a public bar or something like this, right? So maybe Craig, you get, get the story right if you're Googling there. But that guy was made fun of for a decade for opening it. Mm. But the guy did the right thing in retrospect, didn't he? And you know what? Whatever right. I think the right thing or you think, who gives a fuck? It's his bottle. He bought it. Do with what he likes. And he he opened it with friends. And oh, how can you open that piece of history? How can you just pour it willy-nilly? You probably mix it with Coke. Well, no, he tasted it and he did whatever he wanted to do with the thing that he owned. So similarly, whether it's a 100,000 100, pound bottle that someone's just going to sit on, I mean, there, there are probably many uh, great impressionist paintings trapped in a storage facility not on a wall but does that make the person who owned them any less justified and or any less credible or less justified to be proud of that ownership probably not i mean that it's he knows that it's his and that his great grandkids will also own that van gogh or whatever i don't know I, at that point you're right it it does become just a, a tradable commodity it's no longer a drink really at that point so you might as well put it in a plutonium case like nike did yeah yeah it's it's a shame though i think still if 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 you had your like like you, that's a very diplomatic um, point of view sam like I, I do applaud that but i think it's a shame that a, a lot more people don't get to enjoy that artwork um and yeah i wish i wish more people shared but you know the world is the world <laughs> well in the in the case of historical art i agree i think there's hope and and look we know that most of what we see at our galleries was given by wealthy people who owned it and then all was taken pardon I mean, me yeah all was taken british museum that's that's not, that's not <laughs> going there. we've already talked about schmaltz that's uh, I mean, that, that's one of the things i I, sta I started uh up on the central coast mostly because i'm on board and i'm trying to find more people to drink whiskey up here um started my own whiskey club the whole point being as an excuse to open bottles from my collection so we charge a ticket for it, but I'm just charging the cost of me opening up bottles. So I did a whole um, you know, uh, blended uh, whiskey, old school blends tasting. Right? So I bought a whole lot of old blends and auction, cracked them open and uh, enjoyed that uh, with a, a few mates and, and other you know, people we found in there that are into it. Um, someone uh, mentioned um, the first ever SMWS Australian bottling 147.1 sold out in like 20 seconds i got a bottle i was there wait hitting me fresh got a bottle cracked it open straight away that bottle got flipped for a, maybe i should have sold it got flipped for a, it was a 200 dollars bottle got flipped for a grand at auction you know in the following weeks but it's it, in my mind it's designed to be drunk and since i was lucky enough to get the bottle i thought i'll crack it and share it with many as many people as possible um and I, I think it's something that should certainly happen more. It, it is a drink. It is made to be enjoyed. Yeah, Loch, Loch Lead, uh, they released their first uh, whiskey, I think, two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago now. Um, and obviously that's where John Campbell is now. So and uh, they got the first release out. They had they only had them really in bottle shops around the UK. Uh, they all sold out within the first 10 minutes. And then uh, two days later, they were on Scotch Malt Whiskey Auctions and I think one of them is now fetching six hundred and fifty pounds. It was originally fifty-five pounds, oh. so that's in three weeks. That's how much has went up. People trying to grab that first release, and you think, are you drinking it? Is that why you're buying it? Is that like, do you want to taste what that's like? That first release, or are you just doing it because you 
well, yeah. we want some more in 10 years' time, you know. Yeah. The other thing, uh, interesting conversation to talk about is people buying 40-year-old whiskies, etc. right? And then you think about global warming. In Australia, we'll probably never produce a 40-year-old whiskey because the angel share comes off too quickly and you know, the climate's not right here to produce that type of whiskey. As it gets warmer, more likely we won't be able to produce it in Australia, but more likely never to be able to produce it in Scotland because of global warming. Will we now see in the future no more 40-year-old whiskies? Are we looking at an era now where 40-year-old whiskies, this is the last of it? In the next 20, 30, 40 years, we just won't see it because of global warming. The temperature is just too, too fluctuates too much to produce that type of whiskey. Be interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely food for thought. I mean, if if that will, if that argument will help uh, the Ponces in Westminster change some laws around the environment, then let's use that argument. <laughs> oh, you're not going to have old whiskey anymore. Oh, what? what did you say? You got a leap into action then. I don't know. Uh, that's, I mean, remember, it's not, it's not global warming is a bit of a misnomer. It's not net. Although the average temperatures on the planet go up, there could be extreme, as you say, extreme temperatures that I actually could do a favor to maturation and have more <laughs> extreme up and down so it'll give more um uh change i guess year on year and not necessarily evaporation because it, it does hit a certain threshold where it just stops happening right mm -hmm. unless the, unless the, the lads start drinking it but yeah that that is definitely on the cards too that that an old old whiskeys or the opposite man they become so commonplace because now or not even now over the past 20 years distillers have intentionally been sitting on stock to let it mature on so 40 year old might become in scotch anyway, even more common and less justifiable to charge a premium for. I think we've already seen that. You probably have more, well, I've certainly there's more 40 year old whiskeys available. A 30 is probably more accurate. 30 year old whiskeys available than I ever remember. Well, we keep seeing older and older whiskeys being bottled too. You know, an 81 year old McAllen, like how old is the oldest whiskey bottled gonna be? Are we going to see 90 year old whiskeys? Like, what? Who's holding on to cars still that are that old? They're only bottling them because of Bitcoin, right? That's because Bitcoin went up and everybody's got money. <laughs> so then, boom, bottle them all, get the money for them. And then when the market shrinks, yeah. don't bottle anymore. Bitcoin <laughs> crashed, by, crashed by 5% today, got wiped off Bitcoin because of the uh, Russian invasion. So there you go. <laughs> Number so, three. So, not going to use Bitcoin <laughs> to buy tanks. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I personally think they'll use technology like in um, Cavalan and over at Woodford Reserve. Like they'll just temperature control the warehouse for like that, that really expensive stock because they can afford it. And then they could just run it out to 40, 50 years, whatever they want to do. Hmm. Yeah, but not as many people will, will be able to do that. So there won't be as many of them. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Interesting. Oh, yeah, it'll be an interesting uh, few years, that's for sure. Yeah, are you planning yeah. to come back down under, Sam? Are you? Well, I, I was fortunate to be there twice when I was with Balvenie, and they were awesome trips, and I absolutely loved it. Um, I don't go anywhere anymore. I don't even go into town. Honestly, I'd stay home with my kids and drink alone. Or drink, you know, have virtual. I mean, thank God for this. I can't imagine how crazy the last couple of years have been without this internet. But um, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah, I would absolutely love to. I've got no plans, like I said, to even take a tube into town just now. So okay. I'm, I'm trying to get home. My folks are for, are still alive and in Toronto. So I want to get back to Toronto at Easter. And then I'm going to take the kids uh, in the summer as well for a Canadian summer. Uh, so those, those are the only two trips I got planned. My wife's from Norway, so we'll go to Norway as well. We went for Christmas, but yeah, not nothing, nothing all is on the cards yet. But yeah, I would love that. Let's make a reason. Yeah, I mean, we, we are going to try, certainly going to try and get uh, some of the boutique team down here at some point. If it's not Sam, maybe Felix will come back down, our, our cast yeah. buyer, um, Dave Worthington, our ambassador. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a while. We have, I mean, a, a lot of us in the company, except for over a screen, have not seen each other for a couple of years, um, which I'm sure is the case for a lot of people. Mm. Uh, so very much looking forward to getting back to the UK as well. I haven't seen anyone in the flesh in my team for a couple of years. So, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Have you done any tours of these English distilleries, Simon? Have 
You've been to any of these? No, no, I haven't done haven't done any um, English distilleries. Yep. So yeah, I'm I'm very very keen okay. to get back to the the U, the UK and, and do a bit of that. Yep. And um, I'm getting married later in the year, so the, the plan was oh. uh, potentially a honeymoon in Scotland. Because yep. um, because because I'm because I'm that sort of guy. I love it. And I'll, and I'll dra- <laughs> drag drag my, uh, my 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 wife along as well. She, she <laughs> unfortunately she likes whiskey. And really wants to get to Scotland. So. We'll be in the middle of winter. I just got a message from my auntie back right. home saying, I've just woken up and there's three inches of snow outside my bedroom window. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> we went to uh, we went to Scotland in uh, in April and uh, late April, thinking, oh, you know, the weather sort of warms up at the end of April and it's quite dry. And uh, we got there and it snowed the whole two weeks we were there. And everywhere we went, there was just snow lying everywhere. And it's great for photographs. It's great to visit distilleries, but it's cold. And it's so cold that I had a drone with me to do a distillery um, in a view of distilleries from above. Yeah, And as the drone was up, the drone was so cold, it froze up in the air. So <laughs> <laughs> it couldn't even tolerate <laughs> being there. So yeah, I had to bring that down. It didn't work that well, but... Just, just cold. It seems to be cold all the time. <laughs> so, oh well. <laughs> but then, yeah, there, there you go with your, uh, you know, with global global warming. Not necessarily. Uh, <laughs> That's that, yeah. Mate, Scotland, you, you go your honeymoon to Scotland if you want, but don't wear a kilt. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, the good thing is, I can. We can at least come back. We got to go via Singapore on the way back, so we could do a quick trip, stop off in Bali or something as well. So, like, Warm yourself up. Bali yeah. Yeah, you can't get any warmer than the Dubai, I think. That's the please. That's the way. <laughs> that's that. All right, well. Uh, um, just a quick note, like Sam mentioned before, like he, he found the, um, Australia pretty exciting and making exciting whiskies. But I think for me, like the easy, easy um, ticket is actually companies like Boutique. I was lucky enough to be over there um, when Toby had brought those samples in on the day. Um and it was right. like, it's phenomenal what they're doing. It's like the most amazing curated comic library that you'd been to. Like there's, there's an awesome one in Sweden, actually in Stockholm. Um, but that's, that's sort of how I feel Boutique is. Like they make these amazing selections of uh, amazing sort of different casks from around the world. And they do all the hunting for you for something exciting. So if you're looking for something exciting, something a little bit uh, not so serious, but, um, but also serious in tasting and smelling notes, you can tell from the label. Like in the first place, that it's a um, it's a different take on the whiskey industry, and it, I think it brings a lot of excitement and energy um, to the industry, and it, it's it's well and truly overdue. Um, can't wait to see you guys in the future, and you know that that's going to be awesome, man. But um, I'm so glad um, that we've done this tasting, and then more people can find out about boutique. But yeah, I, as I see it, I see it as a, a curated comic library. It's awesome. Like, thanks for having me, anyway. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thanks, yeah, thanks for yeah, coming on. Gary, the podcast, very good. <laughs> I've just, uh, I realised that Denver's going to get up early now for a flight. Yeah, I'm going to go to sleep. Uh, good luck with that one. Um, <laughs> it's a fair travel to the airport. Thanks again to Denver. Thanks to Simon. Thanks to Sam. Thank you very much, Sam, for getting up so early in the morning over there. I know it's tough. <laughs> but, um, the kids took care of that for me. It's almost like the kids wanted to be in this tasting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've we we just had our second child um, about four weeks ago now, and it's funny because the first child you um, if you've had a bad night and they start to sleep, you go, "I'll just sleep now." We know whilst they're sleeping, but you're then now you're rudely waking up with the first child that comes in at six o'clock in the morning, and you're like, "Oh, geez, I forgot all about that one." So yeah, it's juggling that. It's it's, it's quite funny, <laughs> but uh, yeah, early mornings. I'm not an early morning person. More a late night. So. Um, Thanks again. Great information. Wonderful tasting. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. <laughs> <laughs> one the kids prepared for you. Is that one the kids prepared? That's right. I just want to make sure Denver, I did prepare. Is that a, a Garibaldi? Oh, well, okay. <laughs> all right, Garibaldi. All right, great. It was awesome, bud. Thank you. Thanks all for coming yeah. and taking part in that. It was wicked. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye.